Hi everyone, this is Christina with Black Tea News, and today I'm so excited to have my guest, George Alexopoulos, and uh, you may have seen his artwork just kind of taken over the Twitterverse. If you maybe even read, oh no, it's Uncle Joe, which my sister bought herself and beat me to the punch because I wasn't going to buy it for her, and uh, say hello, George, how you doing? What's going on? Good morning. Uh, so... Tell me a little bit about your process. My sister wanted to know how is it possible that you even do this so fast? She said something will break and then like an hour there's four panels. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, I guess with cartooning, the background of cartoonists is that speed is more important than art quality. And that's always been the way of it since, I don't know. I grew up reading like Snoopy and stuff, right? And I've studied Charles Schultz's life and all those guys, the newspaper people. You have to be able to pump out a strip in like an hour if you have a really good idea. Fortunately, the kind of strips that I do are really dependent on news and what's everybody talking about right this second. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times what will happen is I wake up in the morning. I, I'm luckily uh, an early riser, so I get up really early. Um, I'm browsing Twitter, I'm in the bathroom, you know, I take a shower, I'm thinking about the news. Um, so by a certain time in the morning, by the time I'm eating my breakfast, if I don't have an idea for a strip, there's probably not enough time to draw one, but mm -hmm. sometimes I do it anyway. Uh, so the speed is the key, and if I think of something funny or something that uh, gives me a strong image, you know, something of, I don't know, I won't think of examples or something silly that pops up in the news like, oh, that would be funny if I drew this. So by the time I'm finished with my breakfast, you know, I have maybe an hour, two hours. I post the strip and sometimes it lands, sometimes it doesn't. So yeah. I think the most iconic one, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, would probably have to be the Joe Biden when he sucks the black out of a person, a voter. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, that one. That one seems to have done the best. Yeah, probably that and the uh, the dancing nurses one did the best this past year. Oh my if gosh! You've seen that. How like I saw some flack, um, but yeah. how how much blowback did you get for the dancing nurses? Uh, as much as I get for pretty much any strip, um, it, it, it's proportional to how many people respond to it and like like it and stuff. So there's a certain percentage. Let's say five percent of people hate my stuff no matter what. So if it's really popular, then it's still 5%. It just seems like a lot more people are mad. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was surprised, actually, that so many people wanted to – this isn't the right way to say it, but come to the defense of the nurses, quote-unquote. I wasn't really criticizing nurses as a profession or doctors. I just thought that the dancing was in poor taste, let's say. That was the punchline. Uh, so a lot of people are like, oh, how dare you uh, – no, they were saying um, – you know, nurses are people too, and doctors are people too, and they need to be able to have fun. And I'm like, that's not the point I was making, but okay. Uh, so, you know, they were mad about that. They're mad about a whole, pretty much any strip I do these days, there's a certain number of people that are mad. And you kind of have to learn, I guess, to respond to it gracefully. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't respond to it gracefully, it'll just make things worse. And who wants to spend their day arguing with people online anyway? So. Yeah, yeah, well, in regards to the dancing nurses, I mean, I, I saw a lot of those videos, too, and at the same time where there's, I don't know, it just seemed like really, I, I think it was in poor taste because there was such mixed messaging going on, because obviously people want to go back to work and people want to do different things, and yeah. not everyone who has the virus has to be hospitalized, you found new stuff about, they started suggesting you have to be quarantined for less time, and just... Just a whole bunch of information that was totally different from what we initially knew about it. And I know science is a process, but I mean, some people were just wrong. They didn't want to admit they were wrong so they could take advantage, I think, of the system in, in a lot of political regards. But I like, but we had hospitals like, in, I don't know where you live, what state or whatever you live in, like in Michigan, like we had hospitals that were closing down because they couldn't take other patients for other things. Like I, had, I have a friend who, uh, who I'm probably going to mention later, um, but he, he was, a, he's a writer. And he had a mass, and he didn't know if it was cancerous, um, and they wouldn't let him go to the hospital because it wasn't essential surgery. And so for a large portion of the pandemic, he, he had to wonder. So, and, and I've heard other horror stories and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I did think it was an import taste to keep, it, keep having all this, you know, dancing videos. And then also when they started coming out with videos 
uh, with with nurses criticizing or you know people taking their last gasp of air and saying I, I it's a hoax it's a hoax which I don't think people would be saying it's a hoax it's a hoax as they're gasping <laughs> for for air. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of bad things happened at the same time. It just created a giant mess of everyone pulling in their own direction, saying things that are contradictory. Everyone's afraid out of their minds. And on the other hand, you see, if you see nurses and doctors dancing, it's like, wait, so I'm not supposed to be afraid? They're having fun or they're they're trying to cope with something that's really dark. There's a lot of yeah. legitimate opinions. Like I know doctors. I have some in my family, actually. They actually agreed with the comic, and they thought it was in bad taste. But I would understand if they needed to let off some steam, too, and dance, whatever. It's just that there's so much fear and high emotion out there. Sometimes a, a comic strip, it's like, it's so shocking and in poor taste to draw something like this that it snaps people out of it, and they say, wait, this is ridiculous. Maybe we should stop. So a comic is maybe a safe way of showing how ridiculous everyone's being and everyone has to chill. Uh, that's one of that's one of the possible reactions that I think can be a net positive, even if it results in people saying I'm doing stuff in poor taste. Maybe that's OK. Maybe that's part of the job. I, I think that is part of the job, especially for like. A pol- you know a comic strip <laughs> like yeah. of course like like Marvel and other companies like that are like injecting politics like a little well not even a little like way too hard nowadays and movies seem to really want to do that and but you know art has always included political things but you know but back in the original days of like for example the Twilight Zone they were a lot more nuanced about it you know <laughs> and yeah, that, there's I'm sorry we'll go on just good writing has to take, has to be at the front of it. And maybe there are different lessons that you could take from a story, but uh, things like relatable characters, uh, a good moral that everyone can agree with, or lots of people, uh, should take the forefront. But what these political writers try to do, you mentioned Marvel, for example, they take their ideology, put it in the front, and then create stories to uh, reinforce their pre... They've already decided on the moral. Mm -hmm. Um, But what happens with good stories, I think, is that the moral kind of emerges as you're writing it. And it's like, these are truths that have always been true since forever. Uh, I'm a Peterson fan, for example. He always talks about confronting dragons so that you can uh, get treasure, let's say. It's, It's a classic story of risk and reward. You can't get the treasure unless you basically risk yourself or, or self-sacrifice for the good of the, for, for the good of others. That's a great story that maybe we tell a million times, but we don't know, or, or we, we look at different instances of it. Are you familiar with Berserk at all? Mm-mm. Any chance? That's in the news. Oh, it doesn't matter, I guess. But the, the hero is usually described as someone who sacrifices themselves for the good of others, and the villain is the selfish type of person who sacrifices others for the good of themselves. Uh, And that emerges a million times in a million different stories, but we love telling that story for thousands of years because it reinforces something that we all know somehow is is true and good. And this leads to uh, the flourishing of human life or the flourishing of life in general. And that's, we've decided that's a good thing. Uh, whereas a lot of stories that are being pushed these days in pop culture are sort of, um, you know, this group of people are bad and let's pump up this group, but destroy this other group. My dad, he was raised off of comic books uh, when he was, um, he wanted to know how to read because his dad brought some home. That's why he wanted to learn how to read and go to school. And he was upset that they didn't teach you how to read on the first day. And so um, when they started doing the, the comic book burnings and stuff, he was like, deter- like, and his mom was like, I think we may go to the church and burn these. And he's, he was like determined to like run away with them if he had to. Wow. And so she like backed off. And so he had a chance to buy like Amazing Fantasy, what is it, 17 with, with Spider-Man when he was in college. And he went to a comic book shop called the Eye of Agamotto and they had it there and it was $300. But all he had was $300 and he didn't buy it because he knew his mother would have like fussed at him. And so he missed a big opportunity there. But anyway, he kept buying comics through the years and he uh, would buy them for us and raise us on it. Um, my older siblings got associated like we are on a, tr- a mission trip 
uh, driving from Michigan to uh, Alberta, Canada. And so he was like, I'm in the front seat praying. Y'all got to do like whatever in the back. And so, and just like, don't bother me while I'm trying to like focus. And so he brought boxes of comics and they, you know, fell in love with it. And I, you know, start reading some time after that. But he, he, he just liked the morals that those char- characters had. And so he said recently, like a problem with the comics nowadays, which I don't, he'll watch like a Marvel movie every day, but, <laughs> but, he, but he doesn't really buy the books anymore. He said they don't have the same sense of wonder and Marvel, you know, that's why there's called Marvel because you would Marvel at some of the stories and the characters and the colors and all the stuff. But, but now it's just so, I don't know they they're so driven by propaganda rather than good storytelling that they've just really missed the mark. I think uh, we're dealing with very clever people who understand. Uh, we, you said propaganda. That's the right word. They understand that stories can affect uh, thinking. Uh, if you think of it mm-hmm. in computer terms, it's sort of like the mind is just this raw machine that you can feed with any operating system, uh, and a good story can or a well-told story can really rewire a person's brain. Uh, Even we talk about different faiths, let's say. Uh, If you ask them, what are the 10 things you should do and the 10 things you shouldn't do in a list? And each religion or faith will give you a different list, let's say. There are some similarities. And then there are people who have politics as their religion or operating system. And they might give you a, a different list of 10 do's and don'ts or something like that. Uh, Comics are an especially potent way to uh, communicate stories because they use words and pictures. So what what you mentioned with your father, before he could even read, that's really interesting. He was reading comics but couldn't read language. And I think that's fascinating because comics tell stories through sequences of images. And if you've ever seen... um, uh, it's called Making Comics and Understanding Comics by Scott the Cloud, an author. Uh, it's really brilliant if you ever want to study the science of what comics are. But basically he says that you're reading a, a kid, let's say, is reading a comic on two dimensions. One is the visual mm-hmm. and the other is through language. So your dad was able to read and understand the stories even though he couldn't understand language because we could see Humans know how to see before they understand even speech, language. So if you read a comic and it's like this happens and then this happens and this happens, you can understand the story just through your interpretation of the pictures. So I could read a comic uh, made in Japan, manga, and I can understand the story even though I don't read the dialogue. I don't understand it. It it is interesting that there are propagandists who know – in, they're in the fields, creative fields, let's say Marvel we talk about, that they know that they want to push a certain agenda. They have an, an idea. Uh, we, want, we want our readers to believe this by the time they're done reading the comic. So now we're going to construct a story using characters you've known for years, like a puppet show, and we're going to tell this morality story. And there's something in the human mind that just knows that's lame and yeah. fake. And, and there's just something we it, – it looks the same. The pictures look the same. But once you start reading the story, it's like, wait, something's – it's it, – it's, have you heard of the Uncanny Valley? The, no. Um, it's like if you see a robot that's a little too human looking and it's really scary for some reason. Um, it's like a, a normal robot that looks like a little toaster with legs. That's cute. That's funny. Like yeah. Wally. But a robot that looks almost human, but like there's like a dead expression in their eyes or something like that, or they move weird. There's something in us psychologically that's really frightened of that. It's like it looks right, but it's, there's something just wrong about it, and that makes you even more scared. And I think that's what's happening with comics now, especially with the mainstream comics, is it looks like a normal comic. But if you read the details, something's really off and frightening. That just says, like, wait, that character is not supposed to act like that. Yeah. Stuff like that. Well, uh, and th- I'm sure yeah. you, pro- so you follow Jordan Peterson and you being in this industry. No- well, I, I know you know because I saw a comic with, you, with Jordan Peterson kind of making fun of the Red Skull situation yeah. with Ta-Nehisi Coates. And I, I, I was, you know, glad that. I mean, he was initially shocked, I guess, when he saw that. But, you know, they've taken in strides, you know, sold merchandise, raised money for charity, et cetera. But. <laughs> yeah. I was like, 
really disgusted about it on a personal level because I'm like, they're not, and I wrote an article about this on my site, blackteenews.com. I'm like, they're not only talking about Peterson, they're talking about the people that he helps, people who <laughs> seek to better their lives, who may have issues with mental health or whatever reasons yeah. that they that they buy his books. And I'm like, it's not like he's like a pop sensation icon that got famous because he was on TikTok and started giving life advice. I'm like, he's a real, you know, professor psychologist who treats people, you know, and, and so to, to diss them, him and basically call him the red skull, but you're essentially calling people who watch and, and like his material Nazis. So, so on that level it was really disgusting there. Yeah, and brainwashed and stuff. Yeah, like, it, we've been tricked by him because he's telling us good things that we want to hear. And that's not even true. <laughs> Which is ironic because that's what they do. I know. <laughs> it, they're all about projection. I keep seeing this over and over. They accuse us. Uh, well, I won't say us because, you know, we're different people. and I don't want to disrespect. But they accuse me of, uh, I don't know, doing X, Y, and Z. And then it's like, wait a second, but you do that all the time. And your imagination is going into the place to accuse me of something based on things that you are very familiar with. I've never even heard of some of the things they accuse me of until they do it. And then I'm like, wait, so that's your plan, is it? It's very, it's very revealing. It's like they, they can only take things that, that other people make and twist them. They can't make things out of nothing. For some reason, mm-hmm. they, they twist things. Uh, it, it's very, uh, I don't know. It's very telling. You can, you can see if you just listen to their words, it sounds very nice. But then when you see what those words produce, the actions, it's like, uh, it's like that, uh, you know, a tree by its fruit kind of thing. Yeah. But you see their actions, what, what it results in things like, uh, hate, uh, separation, uh, people mistrusting each other, the, the collapse of certain, uh, I don't know. I just see, I see division and nastiness and anger and rage and jealousy. And it's like, wait, so that's the result of everything you're preaching. Whereas the stuff that I like is all about, let's be chill and let's all be friends and let's all help each other. Uh, good stuff like that. You said something oh. pretty interesting. You said they can only, like, take things and twist it and rather than create things. Yeah. And so why, why do you think that is, like, on a philosophical level, intellectual level, or um, th- that that appears to be the case? Like, they, they may want to make something and it just doesn't pan out and they have to hire these folks like Tanishi Coates or whoever to kind of just adjust things rather than making new things. Well, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, Part of it is that people, uh, customers, like things that are familiar. Mm -hmm. Um, So they'll gravitate towards, you know, Coates, for instance, writes uh, Captain America stories. But if he created a whole new uh, character, nobody would recognize that character. And then the story wouldn't be uh, as popular or as well read. Um, On on another hand, uh, they take things that are recognizable because there's more value in destroying their goal is to destroy uh, what has already been established, for instance, or, or manipulate it, twist it, change it. Uh, for them, they see it as a good thing. Um, they want to subvert and change. Culture norms? or Sure. Uh, things that Captain America stands for, for instance, and uh, we're just going to change a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And then you look at all the changes over 10 years, And you see the direction they're going. It's like, oh, whoa, where are you going with this now? And then all the people who were sounding the alarm 10 years ago and were called crazy. And it turns out, like, no, uh, they they saw where this was going 10 years ago. Uh, I encountered these people because I've been involved in the art scene for my whole life. Um, Let's see. When I was 18, I knew a bunch of kids who, no, before that even, like poetry kids, art kids, and all this sort of thing. Uh, They were go into cafes where there was stuff like slam poetry and super feminist stuff and racial stuff. And I just wanted to hang out because I was into, I was into art. I wanted to make friends and stuff. And then they're saying all these things at these little cafes and meetings that I was like freaked out by. I'm like, wait, imagine if these people actually like right now, they just sound like crazy weirdos, but 
imagine if they actually had influence. And then 20 years later, I'm seeing them with influence. I'm like, oh, no, it's these same people. <laughs> I, was, I was scared of them when I was 17. I'm like, oh, geez, they're just weird. They're just art weirdos. I can't be friends with these people, but I'm also an artist. So that's, that sucks. I can't be friends with them. They won't be friends with me. Um, so I've, I've seen where they've been going with this for a long time. And, of course, this has happened long before either of us were born. Um, what we're really seeing is just uh, the extension of the aftermath of World War II uh, and the Cold War. Uh, it, the Cold War ended in our lifetime, but it's still going on. Yeah, it's or just we making, thought it did. <laughs> or people yeah. think it did. <laughs> yeah, we were born into a generation where we thought everything was chill, but no, we've inherited a hell of a bad situation that it's actually the most dangerous when you don't notice it happening. So it's like... A lot of cultural problems, people are like saying, oh, the schools have been taken over by these weirdos. Uh, all kinds of institutions, including entertainment, have been taken over by these weirdos. And they're surprised. They're like, where did they come from? It's like, no, I've known these people have been here for a long time. I just didn't – I don't know how to stop them um, because nobody, nobody wants to realize how bad it is until it's way too late. And it's like you mentioned uh, cancerous growths. It's like – once the tumors reach the point where it's attached itself to vital organs, it's like, no, now we have to actually cut into the organ and possibly harm the patient to get rid of this cancerous growth. And that's where these ideological uh, zealots are the most dangerous. Is it's, they make it so that if you get rid of them, you have to damage your own society to get rid of them. And that's where it's really dangerous. And what's scary is what happens if they are allowed to grow even more, which is what's happening culturally, sadly. Yeah. Uh, it'll do even more damage to even just bring us back to where we were in like the 90s. Um, so I don't want to say I'm not optimistic. I'm fighting like hell, but like <laughs> <laughs> to put it a certain way, I'm not I don't mean fighting like hell, you know, in the Trumpish way. Yeah. You know starting to riot over here. <laughs> I'll ask about that later. I'm curious. But um, yeah, it's it's getting to a point where fighting back means like this is our generation's war. It's not going to be fighting with guns and, you know, on a battlefield. But like people can be doxxed, their lives, their incomes are being ruined. It's really actually dangerous. People can show up to your house now. Yeah. Um, the the but news media may show up to your house to ask about a meme, which is like <sighs> ridiculous. But you know what? If if we're not willing to fight now, imagine how much worse it'll get if we don't. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I um, you know, as a, a black conservative, I, I don't know how much you sniffed around but or, or gathered. But, yeah, <laughs> I, I picked that up. Yeah. OK, but um, people ask me all the time or say things like, oh, my gosh, you're so brave. Like I went to a, a, a service uh, a couple weeks ago and like uh, the, the pastor is like on the pulpit, very like peace, 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 peace. And like, he's so interested in politics and stuff. And so he's like, Oh my gosh, you like, you're, you know, you, you say a lot of stuff that I can't say. And I'm just like, well, I'm outnumbered <laughs> then <laughs> people tell me like, just in general, you're so brave. And I'm like, I appreciate like everyone saying that and like lavishing compliments and stuff like that. But I don't, I don't, it's just like our way. Like we're just, like there's a scripture like cry loud spare not like like I like grew up in a holiness church like we you know not like burn everybody if you come in like with your skirts a little too short not nothing like that but like you see injustice you speak up about it so that's just my way so I'm just like doing what I've always done and now that's just like not what you're supposed to do but now I am like very alone it seems like and it's like if we all just came together then, then these people would be outnumbered because there's, I believe there's still more normal people out there, <laughs> but yes. they just want to be left alone. And I, I understand that totally, but these people don't want to leave you alone. Well, what they want is to continue growing in the dark so that they become so uh, deeply a part of the organism that it's easier to just not fight them. Um, when yeah. you mentioned bravery and speaking out and being in the minority, the uh, let's say people who want to fight, uh, it's a very small amount of people because there's nothing to be gained from it, really. Um, 
or there's a lot of risk, let's say. My reputation right now is so destroyed that I'm not sure I'll ever find work again in the entertainment industry. Like, I'll be indie for the rest of my life, probably, unless culture turns around. But I've decided at some point um, that it's just, it's an all or nothing kind of bet where I have to decide, like, am I just going to be, like, I'd rather speak and be called names than be quiet and then helpless when I see horrible things happening around me. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just in my nature. Now, I'm not brave. I'm not I'm not a lot of things that people say, like, it's complimentary and nice to say things like that, but I am actually a terrified little, like, I'm very, a wisp of a person, like, in real life. Uh, But that's even more important for someone to, symbolically, you got to be able to see people standing up so that you can create a chain reaction of other people being brave and saying, this is crap. Uh, Maybe, maybe... But you see, that, that puts you in a position where the bad guys, let's say, are going to want to make you an example of so that the regular people will say, oh, a bad thing happened to so-and-so for speaking out. Therefore, I'm going to be quiet. So you that's... Know the, the funny thing about, like, the left and stuff, like, um, I've seen uh, uh, Chris Hayes. And so he tweeted something, like, about people and cancel culture. And he's like, well, they, you know, they have the attitude, like, if they didn't kill you, like, did you die? <laughs> <laughs> like I yeah, like I yeah. can't remember word for word what he said, but I screenshot it somewhere because I just thought it was so ridiculous. Like they feel like if you survived, then they did you no harm, and you shouldn't complain about it. Like Ben Shapiro, just because he's like the number one like news source that people look at on Facebook or something, that that they're not throttled sometimes when they are, you know, <laughs> or like just because Stephen Crowder wins his lawsuits and gets like YouTube's occasionally, that that he's not a victim. Like uh, he didn't lay down and ma- let himself be killed, but you are still trying to stab him to death, like. Yeah. Or uh, Andy No, for instance, there he got beaten up. Things were thrown on him. Oh He's yeah. Been threatened. Uh, he wrote in his book. Uh, I forget the title now. I've read it. Um, he wrote a book about Antifa where they showed up to his house several times. His parents' house. Constant harassment. Even people that look like him, like because you know all Asians look alike, right? So they're like, oh, it's an Asian guy. It must be Andy No. Let's attack him. And the guy's like, hey, wait a second. I'm just an Asian guy. Do you think? So they're attacking people that even look like him. And uh, you get stories like this, and they, they want to act like it's no big deal. But then January 6th happened, which was a terrible mistake, by the way. But January 6th happens, and it was mostly a bunch of idiots running around making noise. And they want to act like it was worse than 9-11, they yeah. said. You said you it's were like, curious. Were you, you were curious about my reaction to it? Yeah. Um, well, it was bizarre, like, hearing about it on the news the first day when it all went down and I had friends who went down there not, I don't know anyone personally who was inside the Capitol when any of that happened. Um, I've, I've seen people who are friends of friends who well, I guess were there, but they were kind of like one, they felt they were kind of caught up in the moment and two, they, they were kind of like, it's the people's house. I was like, okay, if that's how you feel. <laughs> they were doing like stuff at the time. Like I, I, I visited like there, it's, they're pretty like, you know, anal about how you go in, what you can bring in the, you know, so there are rules. <laughs> so, um, so when I saw everything go down, I'm just like, you guys did a dumb thing. I didn't like the fact that Trump was leading the rally, by the way. Like, um, I, I, I felt like you can ha- you can handle your disagreements or your grievances with a little more gracefully. And at first I thought maybe he would, when he was like, okay, we'll go to the courts. We'll do this. He tweeted some stuff. I'm like, that's, that's fine. And, and I've heard so many crazy things and I knew people at like Detroit, the TCF center and stuff that I was hearing them. Like, I, I think people need to look into this as, at least a little bit, but by, yeah. by that time I'm like, no, you should not be having a rally while they're doing this. So, um, so I, I didn't like that, uh, personally. And I'm like, I, it's his case to make. So I so I know people who went down there to support him because they love him. I'm like, if he wanted to have like a final, I'm the best president ever rally, like I was <laughs> fine going to that, but not like a, no, we think we're cheated. And by the way, like, I, I think that the things that they did, like the stuff that Time Magazine wrote about, how they lobbied people to change the rules, how they uh, w- with took advantage of COVID, kept the country locked down, 
uh, block stories like the New York Post story and um, not let Biden or care that he wouldn't answer questions, just like the consorted effort of like all levers of society to get Trump out. I think those things are far more even scary and egregious than dominion like stuff like the people say happened. I'm like, yeah. and if you don't fix those things, I don't care if you put every law in the book, we'll never win again. So I'm like, people are so upset about one thing when I'm like, that's not even like the the war we should be like really, really concentrated about. Like, <laughs> so I've got like a whole like a mess of things to, to hash out with my party. So I'm pretty mm-hmm. like deeply involved, like in Michigan, but, um, but my my thoughts, I, what I really, really, really couldn't believe is that Kamala and Biden started talking about how, like, people start comparing it to the riots. And they start saying, like, oh, they're treating these people better than they treated at the riots. I'm like, those people were killing people. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, we're burning property. Like, it's, I'm like, I just couldn't believe that they dared to even compare the two. Because I wouldn't have compared the two. And now no. since you compared the two, I'm like, you guys are so foolish and full of crap. And I hate that politicians in in the liberal media like act like January 6th was so much worse than the stuff that happened during the summer because it, it what it tells me and I it was bad like visually like they got people I know and like you got played you guys shouldn't have did that it it was you just got played it was it was awful and but but the stuff that happened during the summer and how Democrats ignored it or if they didn't ignore it they cheered it on uh, Chris Cuomo was like, show me where it says that protests have to be peaceful. I'm yeah. like, you, you guys did all that stuff and it hurt people. They burned down low income housing. They, they burned down, uh, you know, family businesses. They burned down and looted like targets and, and other stuff like that. P- people where low income people were minorities or whatever would go and have nowhere to go. Like I've saw so many videos of people crying cause they've lost their livelihood. People lost their lives. Like Officer Dorn, and I'm yeah. like, what you guys care about the capital thing? One, because you want to take advantage of, it, but but two, because and the the most important thing is that why they really really care about that more is because they think they are so far more important than everyone else. Yeah. I don't care if you elected if everyone if a group of people got together to elect someone and to send them to Congress, they're not more important than than Officer Dorn. They're not more important than the than the family that lost their furniture store they're not more important than the families that lost their their housing their livelihood in local housing areas or wherever they're not more important than those people so i i feel passionately how dare those fools say such a thing so it that's where i stand yeah (laughs) they're what they were really doing and it was i hate to compliment them but it was the perfect move the perfect reversal (laughs) Being quiet through all of 2020, where there was nonstop riots, you mentioned, and they call them protests. They didn't show pictures or footage of – they only showed the bad things that happened that they could pin to Trump supporters. They never showed all the stuff that we saw on Twitter, let's say, or in alternative media, all the actual footage from the ground where we saw this stuff happening. They were acting like, oh, we're just out here you know, doing justice things and being – we're being the good guys and all the stuff that you saw on CNN, for instance, uh, I don't know what the ratio was, but they didn't show all the riots on mainstream media. I understand. Uh, mm-hmm. but they, they sure talked about January 6th a whole lot. And, uh, they, you said they played us and that's exactly what happened is that they, it's, they know it's all about optics and being able to spin a story. So for instance, if I was an evil comics creator, um, I could take a whole bunch of images from this or that uh, situation that really happened and then kind of twist them just enough, just a little bit, to start telling a different narrative. Like, I don't know, I could I could make up a story about someone and start saying that they're, they did this on this day or something like that and just slowly start to edge in and start telling people this is what really happened. And what happens psychologically with people is that I think the more you're exposed to something – the more you think it's real. And the news, since it's controlled by these establishment, uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, the Pelosi types and all those people and Schumer, 
they're so in bed with the news that they can control pretty much any narrative that they want to. Whereas independent media, if you look at like just people filming the things that are happening, especially during 2020, a different way, different picture emerges of violent psychos breaking into buildings, burning them down, hurting people, stealing, looting, rioting. It's like, is this the behavior of people who really want the best for society or like they're saying things? That's why you talk. We talked about um, I mentioned, you know, a tree by its fruit kind of thing. I don't care what they're saying most of the time, but when I see what they're doing yeah. and I see riots and looting and people being hurt and threatened in the streets and all that kind of stuff, it's like, no, no, I don't care if you're the sweetest talking, nicest person in the world. When I see that that's the result of your speech, I don't care what you're saying. I don't care how you plan to get to that utopia. I've, I've seen your true face. I've seen your face beneath the mask. So anyway, we know what they are. The real challenge is convincing, like let's say there is all kinds of election interference happening. What sane people would have to do, I think, the solution is to create so many votes that there's no amount of faking that can happen. Like let's say Biden won by however many millions, which I don't believe, but whatever. Then we have to convince people who are in the middle who didn't vote because they say, whatever, voting doesn't affect anything. And I, I kind of agree. I, but one of some – there's people in the middle who don't vote who I knew personally, who I, I just I, – they saw my passion and they said, you know what? I'm going to go vote, George, because I agree that it's something, something important is happening. Now, our votes didn't matter this time. But I think next time we know that interference can happen. So we have to generate numbers that are so overwhelming that they can't be they can't be overwritten by any amount of interference. Like the COVID thing was a freak occurrence. It may never happen again. If COVID happens again in 2024, that will be the most suspicious thing in all history. Yeah, I I I I think the thing that we did the most harm with is showed what what we allow them to get away with. I think that's the biggest harm. Of course, economically, you can see a lot of different harm. Psychologically, you can see a lot of harm. But the rights thing, um, I think we'll find out. A lot of people are thinking we'll find out later rather than sooner, and I, I don't think that's true. How damaging <laughs> that was <laughs> uh, with yeah. how much we're, we were willing to take, which broke my heart, too, watching just a lot of stuff go down, like especially like a lot of people who just kind of laid down with the church with like going to church and others like practicing like your right to assemble and your freedom of speech. <laughs> so yeah, that's really sad. But that I think we talk, have you heard of the, uh, again, Peterson stuff? Like he talks about agreeableness Yeah. and, uh, very agreeable people will just kind of go with the flow. They'll do what the government says. And I can agree with that to a certain point. But I also have a high amount of disagreeableness where if I'm told to do something, I'll look at the opposite thing and just be like, why aren't you letting me look at that? So why aren't you letting me assemble now that everything's OK? What actually is happening here? So I'm the type of person who questions just for the sake of it. But I have family members who are still scared to go to church, for instance, and I just I pity them. They're still terrified out of their minds, and maybe they've been screwed up for life because of this, and there's nothing I can do to help them. It's just their nature, and it breaks my heart. But I think a certain amount of bravery – so, for instance, you talk about the church people. I, I grew up in, in a Protestant background. I'm agnostic now, but I have this strong thing, this strong background of – the government is not always right, and sometimes they'll tell you something that is actively wrong, and the Bible commands a believer to to do what's right, even though the government tells you not yeah. to do it. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily, like, go out and hurt people or fight in a bad way, but, like, resist um, civil disobedience, all that stuff. But there, there are other tactics that I know people who went to church, even though in my area, the New York area, there were heavy lockdowns. But they went to church anyway because Christians don't necessarily – it's like we don't care what the man says, what Caesar says. In the early church, they met and had church even though they could have died yeah. for being caught. And it's like 
my challenge, because I'm not practicing, I don't challenge Christians as much as I would have 10 years ago, let's say. But like uh, the early disciples and the apostles were ready to die for going for assembling in like a basement and, you know, talk, sharing the gospel with people for like 200 <laughs> years. Right. Yeah. And it was only after became a Roman uh, of the official religion of Rome. But before that, Christians for hundreds of years, maybe 200 years, something like that, were being murdered, thrown to lions. And and I wrote a comic joking about this, too, but it was dark of like in the early church, they, they were like begging the Romans, hey, uh, uh, please boil me in oil. I, I, I don't even deserve to die like Jesus. Uh, crucify me upside down. Uh, throw me to the gladiator pits, for God's sake. But like today, Christians are very scared of <laughs> what? Getting you, talk, getting your fing- a finger waved at you from a cop. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't even know what to say. Like even when Trump was like, okay, I executive order, I church is essential. And then um, the, the singer, um, who he wrote, Hezekiah Walker, um, he's a pastor too, um, but he like wrote a post and he's like, I, that, the churches, we're not going back to our churches until the White House opens up for like public gatherings. I'm like one, why would you like dictate your opening of your church to what man says, <laughs> like in the government? That, that's just stupid. Like, why wouldn't you just say when it's, you feel that it's acceptably safe or something? Like, why, like, why are you, like, trying to challenge them in this way? I'm like, do you believe your church is essential? You can choose to shut it down, but why are you, like, clapping back? And they did that because they didn't like him, and they are just accusing him of doing things to appeal to the black vote or black church or whatever. And I'm like, you should believe that your church is, is essential because you believe it is essential. <laughs> and if and if you're running a church and you don't believe it is essential, then you need to shut it down. <laughs> And then and let your members go somewhere else. Whether you believe that it's safe to get, gather, that's not even like the thing. Like if you believe that it was unsafe to gather, that that's one thing. But like at least like respect people who want to fight for their rights. And then you got so I get, there was so much pushback on it that it, arguing with people like you, you mentioned about the, the following of the laws and other stuff like that. First, I, and I would argue with people. I'm like, no, the Constitution is on my side, so I'm not even like breaking the rules. They're breaking the rules. Yeah. <laughs> um. But. Um, it's, I've also it's, noticed. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, but like when you, if you Google like, Ro, Ro, I think it was Romans 13. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sorry, anyone who's like ah. But um, <laughs> when when you talk about like following the rules or whatever that people were trying to to say to follow this or whatever, if you Google it, um, and and, and about politics and that, you'll find like the stories from like Trump and the border. And I maybe it was Rick Santorum or somebody said we have to obey the laws of the land, and people were upset about that. So I'm like, oh, so the libs were upset when someone said obey our border rules, <laughs> but they they're upset when we're like, no, we want to not you know not go to church for like a year. So <laughs> like, but you know they're hypocrites. But it's just like here's like a fine example. There's a lot of people pulling in different directions and. Early on last year when it was just starting and we didn't know what this was, a little bit of panic is forgivable, I would say, like, yeah. even for me. like, And I live in an area that was hit pro- probably among the worst in the United States. Um, and we're still wearing masks when we go outside or are still in stores and all that stuff. A very dense area. Um, but my idea is that I don't want to necessarily scare anyone or add to the negativity. So I just follow whatever, you know the rules i don't care but um you mentioned in when people went to church uh, or we're talking about let's go to church after we found out that it's maybe a little worse than the flu but not much um and people are still scared of gathering um back in back then i was thinking like uh church church especially is not a building um it's it's people it's you could have church at someone's house just by having a few people come together and like 10 people, whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, back in the day, I was very excited about like, Oh, when you're, where two or more are gathered, there I am among you. Jesus said, for instance, it's like the whole point is if a whole bunch of people are just getting together in worship or whatever, in reverence, and, or, you know, thinking about God, praying, and praising and all that good stuff. 
that's church and it doesn't it's not the building it's not the pastor i come from a background where we didn't even have a pastor it was just a bunch of you know people who loved god and all that stuff but um i don't i don't support the idea of um people being afraid to gather uh, all right so it's one thing if you don't want to gather gather with other people because you're afraid of catching a disease whatever i understand it's scary um but trying to stop other people once it's been established that it's actually not as scary as we initially thought we thought it was the zombie apocalypse at first yeah we're saying by, like millions of people are gonna die food. right and i was scared out of my mind because i live where i live but it's like once we realized no you don't have to hoard food everything's fine the supply chain's fine oh okay let's go back to normal then and then a year later, we're still not back to normal. So that's that was a horrible overcorrection in which, like, we learned the the solution was way worse than the problem. And As just Trump like said. after, yeah, after nine eleven, they had the Patriot Act, and all kinds of horrible things happened to our human rights as citizens. Whatever, it was the same thing. They they don't let a good crisis go to waste, and it was horrible. Uh, how many worse things happened as a result of one terrible tragedy. And we're still like, for God's sakes, our generation went through 9-11. We saw the world pre and post 9-11. And it was a net, I would argue, it, it, we never recovered after 9-11. It was just, it was worse afterwards, way worse. And then post COVID, I feel like it's going to be worse again. And then just to say, I want to go back to normal. It's like, what are you, uh, a revolutionary horrible person you want to kill grandma like so if that's what it takes i'm going to be called names for the rest of my life just to say like i want to be back to normal and i don't want to give uncle sam every right under the sun to like rule my life mm -hmm. if that makes me a jerk fine uh, but i don't it, i don't plan really to be go Sorry. Um, well, we're really being conditioned that if you believe in your liberties, then you're a selfish person. I was, um, I saw someone on TikTok was like, these two guys are arguing because one person was like, there was like these liberals who were like, we, you know, Joe's not doing what we thought and maybe we can come together in unity. And so one guy that I follow who's a friend with me, he's like, no, you guys are wrong. I moved, I moved out of California to a red state. I'm happy here. Just don't come here and ruin things. I've got nothing to talk about. And so another yeah. conservative person was criticizing them like, well, we need unity. We need to come together. We need to listen. I was like, so I kind of jumped in. I was like, hold on a second. We need to know why they don't like Biden because if they don't like him because they thought he was going to be a moderate, it's like, well, they should have known better, but you can maybe work with that. If they're like, well, I, I thought he was going to be far more progressive. I'm like, well, and that's why they don't like him. Like, well, we're going two different opposite directions, so we didn't get yeah. kind of nothing to talk about. People want unity, but it's like, a, what are we unifying over? What are we talking about? What are we, you know? So <laughs> it's like they're saying we just want the fighting to stop, and they say unity by accident. Yeah. Well, Jin Saki was funny because because uh, they were asking like, is he going to meet with like Republicans? Is he get like they're just doing things that all Democrats are doing, and there's not like a lot of working together and. You guys said that you're going to unify. And she's like, oh, I didn't mean that. Like, we were going to, like, work across the aisle. And I'm just kind of paraphrasing. But <laughs> it was like we meant, like, unifying around, like, an idea or something. Like, so, so yeah. basically, like, everyone has to get on board. And so so Mitt Romney and all these other Republicans are, or like, uh, Ben, not Ben Sass, um, Jeff Flake and, and people like that who are just kind of hopeful, though, he go back to just working together, which I don't get that because Trump got bipartisan legislation like the crime bill regard like that was no small feat to get that thing passed um and that was bipartisan efforts and it's like but with obama and joe biden when they're in the white house their attitude was we won <laughs> that's what they said like elections have consequences that was their ideology so it never made any sense to me, why they would want to get rid of someone who they agree with like 99% of the time, but you know, they just don't like his style or whatever. I like, I get, they don't like his style. Like I, you know, I get that, but, <laughs> but I, I to, to me, I guess the main problem with Republicans that I see, like the people I, I mentioned is that they, they are fine with, with not governing. They just want to look 
like they're dignified, you know, <laughs> like Mitt Romney could look at like someone in a tar pit, like drowning and, and it could be like America's drowning and, and, and there's all this progressiveness, like about to like take them out. And they're like, I would help you, but I don't want to get my hands dirty. Like that's how I feel. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I've been saying lately that I lean conservative, but I have not historically liked the Republican Party as a party. And I don't like being a joiner anyway, but um, I don't like seeing the, uh, you mentioned Romney and those guys. And uh, what's her name? Liz uh, Cheney. Liz Cheney, yeah, those people. It's, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I didn't know Liz Cheney was in the Congress until all this stuff jumped out, which I'm yeah. sure is why she did it, like, for fame. Her side and her dad and the Bush people and uh, the post-9-11 stuff, I lost almost all respect for them uh, after I saw Patriot Act stuff happening and all the things they were doing uh, to to prevent terrorism, I guess. They, I think they overreached real bad. And um, I don't know, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily be on their side right now, except for I think Trump has created a snowball effect that we've never seen in our lifetime. And I'm interested to see where it's going to go. Uh, people are talking about DeSantis now, for instance. And That's like my dude Texas. right now. Yeah, I'm watching them, and, you know, I'm not a huge political guy, actually, despite all the stuff I write and draw. It's just mostly for fun. But uh, I am watching them like, okay, I can kind of support what they're doing. I I'm going to keep an eye on them. I'm not going to, like, tie my life to their party or anything. But, yeah. DeSantis, I feel like I don't. I do not know if Trump's going to come back and actually run. And there, are obviously, there's issues with people being that old. I don't think he'd be that as senile as Joe is, but obviously, it's an issue. We need to have a, a meaningful conversation about it. Um, but um, he's home, golfing. He's not like the villain. I mean, they still talk about him a lot, but it's not what like what it was. Like, I don't understand why you would come back. <laughs> personally other than like petty and he is that petty so perhaps yes. um but ron DeSantis, like if they were head to head like you'd have to like really do some convincing to me to not go with DeSantis right now i like people say he should be his vp i think that's a waste of potential and time for him to be vice president um De DeSantis is sort of my guy right now and i said like barring like some kind of scandal like obviously there's a lot, a lot of things happen in the world of politics from here to 2024 but sure um He's, he's, he's my guy right now. Like they, uh, Tucker Carlson asked him if he had any regrets and his regret like was that they even bothered to shut down Florida for the little bit of time. <laughs> I was like, this is my guy. Yeah, this is my guy. He seems pretty solid. I'm sure they're going to try to like Kavanaugh him at some point, <laughs> but, um, I, I'd like to keep an eye on these guys for sure. Um, I, I sometimes think that it's good as much of a nightmare as it can be to think that our votes don't matter because they could be overwritten. Uh, that's a very scary Pandora's box, but it's almost a good thing that we've been shocked awake so that maybe the people who were inactive before are suddenly taking notice and saying, wait a second, if I had just been involved, maybe things wouldn't have gone this way. If, and, and when you see things going bad and say like the education industry, the, the uh, entertainment industries and all that stuff. And they're, they're looking at the, the mess being left behind. There's, they're realizing, wait, if I continue doing nothing, this may get worse. Yeah. So before maybe they were just kind of like, I'm just going to worry about my own life, but they're being alerted now. Maybe, maybe we can save it in time. You know, if people don't do something, it, it is 100% going to get worse. That's why there's so much pushback with, like, Georgia election laws and so on. Like, people are like, well, the timing. These Republicans, they're mad about losing the election. They just want to steal it back. It's just like, first of all, a lot of things happened during the COVID era. And there, I thought the law is actually too lenient or whatever. <laughs> like, in Michigan, you have a voting day. Uh, you guys are complaining because you have, like, two weeks. Just be quiet. Like... <laughs> So, um, yes. like, drop-off boxes, those weren't a thing. So they're, like, writing rules to, like, regulate those things. So it makes sense that you institute some, some laws or whatever. So um, it's not suspicious. Republicans always want voter ID. I've been at Republican conventions, looked someone dead in their eye, people that I knew. I said, you got to go back to your car and get your ID. Like, we're very sticklers, big sticklers for the rules. And Democrats have IDs at their conventions, too. So they're just full of crap. Everyone has an ID. 
it, it's such a stupid it's just a stupid thing but the, but it's so offensive to say that a person is too too what uneducated to be able to get an id yeah stupid poor whatever I, and I, they and they turn that into a race thing too like or or an immigrant is going to be able to figure out how to get online and pick up some id or something like that a legal immigrant but they they want to fluff the numbers that's that's the scary thing yeah like there there's there's that thing there but also like them they they're the real big scam is that they're pushing the racism thing and, and they're making like it seem like these states can't be trusted because there's too many like Republicans who are salty about the election that they have to turn over to the federal government. So they're pushing that um, for the people act. And it's really crazy when you think about, if, I don't if you recall back to 2016, they asked Obama like, well, Trump is saying that the election's going to be rigged, which I think Trump was kind of maybe talking more of the lines of like how they are treating him. Like, is is in that kind of rigged sense? Which he, was, if that's the case, then he's correct. But, um, but oh, they're, so they're like, well, can you promise the election will be fair? And he's like, what kind of question is that? We don't run the election. That's on a state level. Federal government doesn't run that. So he, so he let the cat out of the bag then. That our elections are safer because it's so diverse across the country. Even like if you go to a different county, which I had to do the recount. Thanks a lot, you jerks. Um, like in 2016, and like even like looking at the ballots and stuff from like my side of the state to like the other side of the state is like totally different. So it being such a diverse system helps protect the integrity of the election. So they are probably listening to Obama back then. It was like he has a point. We have to change this so we can rig the election. So so that's their goal now to take over things federally. And so and and, and maybe not even for the sake of like they they if they have like every lever of power, including what you consume media wise, they don't technically even need to set up systems to cheat or any like like some kind of thing that would change your vote like if they pump out enough numbers and they're basically brainwashing the masses with with culture entertainment and the media controlling what kind of media gets out like the hunter biden story for example being censored if they can do all those things white par parlor off the apps have no different comp competition then they can control the elections that's why they they're they're so pro popular vote because Sheep are easy to hurt, <laughs> you know? They know to take over what I call nerve centers. So giant clusters of people, wherever they gather, they know that we don't have to actually take over a lot of space. We just need to influence a lot of minds at once, and then it'll trickle outwards, the influence. You just take over just enough places. So we know that there are Actually, they're not, a, they're not a lot of them, but they're very loud, and it sounds like there's a lot of them. So it makes the people who are in the middle scared of acting, and they just go quiet. Yeah. Um, if you see people like me, for instance, a cartoonist or something like that, someone who's just kidding around, right? If we vanish from, say, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff, you'll know that we were too effective, and we had to be quieted. We, you see people vanishing, like... Trump being kicked off Twitter and there was that whole snowball effect. We thought that was the end of Twitter. We're just going to have to find another place to gather. Uh, virtually, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And then physically, that's also a problem because people still don't go to churches, for instance, or, or the equivalent of churches where we can just meet up with lots of people and talk about our feelings, just express what's on our mind. Um, if you have people with like stethoscopes on the walls listening to those conversations, um, they're going to be able to influence where those conversations are going and, and neutralize. They just want to remain in power. We know that. That's their end goal. Yeah. But how do they do that? By, by controlling the conversations and selectively quieting certain influencers. Um, so that's where the the average Joes out there just needs to be aware, be careful, because once the bigger people start vanishing, um, that's when you're kind of, I feel like an animal in a zoo sometimes. Like I'll speak into the void and nobody hears me because nobody, I don't know, I've been nerfed somehow. Um, but in the next two years, 2022, and then of course 2024, there is an opportunity to gather a bunch of people who actually care. If they don't care, 
I can't force them to. Yeah. But if they do care and they don't act, that's a shame to me. And I want to try to motivate those people over the next couple of years. Just if you're if you have any stake in this at all, if you care, please try to tell everyone you know. Let, like let's jump on this and try to turn things around. Maybe we can fix it. I don't actually know if we can. Maybe it's too late. But it would be a shame to just sit and let it happen. Um, I don't want to be on my deathbed someday and say, oh, man, if only I had taken a few more risks. But, you know, I don't want to have the net result of my life be like, well, I played it safe and nothing happened. And that's the story of my life. Uh, that would be a shame to me. Yeah. Um, I think we can beat it back to some degree, but I. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I think we, I think we can beat it back to some degree, and maybe like I mean Joe Biden, he's already getting the Jimmy Carter reputation, which is so funny to me that some people don't even realize how much of an insult that is because they're just so. I mean, I that's not my era, but like pick up a book, man. <laughs> like <laughs> they just see a sweet smiling old man. Um, you know, my mom. We were talking about Jimmy Carter, and my mom was like, "Jimmy Carter was a douchebag." I was like, "I didn't know mom knew that word." <laughs> I can't believe, like, I never heard her say a word like that at all. Like, <laughs> like I, I'm surprised. I'm like, he must be like, oh, really bad. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, but people don't pick up books or whatever. But I, of course, after that, there was like, you know, the era of Reagan and more prosperity and other stuff like that. So hopefully, Biden's just a dip. It, but I think they're do, they're doing so many things right now that there there's going to be. And, and with COVID and other stuff, too, that there's just there is a permanent effect in some places that that will still feel the shockwave of. But a lot of these cultural fights, we need we need to make sure that we have them like they're pushing things in our schools and, and that are just egregious and to, to the kids. But speaking of kids, I do want to talk about the Uncle Joe story, because I mean, you, you you did. First of all, the illustration is like really good. Um, I just love the, the your art and. It is so weird and creepy. My my nieces and nephew were over uh, my parents' house where my younger sister lives, and they did find the book. Oh, no. <laughs> my sister, who is, I mean, my, my niece, who is three, she's just like. Oh, he's, no. He's like, he's not real, is she? Is he? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> my sister was like, well, uh, he doesn't eat children, but he is oh, real. My and she just started whimpering. No. <laughs> I've always wondered if that would happen. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. It's funny. <laughs> oh man. Um, but but I'll. I mean, it's a, it's like a. I mean, it's a book book with you know that you've taken time to with the writing and the art and stuff. So I mean, what was your? I mean, there's a lot of different things you touch politically. I mean, not just Joe Biden eating children, but like obviously the parents are like cowards willing to sacrifice their their kids and. There's a teacher who's like, we can do anything, have reality be what it is. You're teaching Common Core, two plus two yeah. is five. Um, and there's like a section about COVID and people wearing masks. So like ultimately, I suppose, what what was your overarching theme or thing that you want people to take away? Because there's, there's tidbits of things, but. Um, well, there's a lot of, you mentioned a lot of the themes that are sort of, um, Earlier with Marvel, for instance, we talked about they like to propagandize and they have these stories. And a lot of children's stories have these morals that are pre-decided upon. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's bad to be jealous, so this fox uh, ate the bird or something, you know, an Aesop's fable. And I grew up with a lot of children's stories. So I had been talking to somebody about making a Biden book. And that was all we discussed. We'll make a book about Biden because it's a funny subject. It's, oh, what if he was a monster who ate kids? And I took that idea and I kept thinking about it. And I said, okay, so I don't want to make a children's story necessarily. But what if I made an adult, a, a children's story for adults that would scare the hell out of all of us? <laughs> where, you know, the idea of him being a monster coming to get us. Everybody knows the feeling of, you know, being afraid of a monster coming to get you. I'm an adult, and I still, when I'm sleeping, I, like, look over my shoulder at the doorway. I'm like, oh, that'd be scary. Um, so I I wanted to, because this was pre-election, I, I wrote this and drew this pre-election. 
Um, so we didn't know the results. And I was thinking, how scary would it be if you know Biden came into power? So, for instance, we know, we suspect he's not in control of the party, and he doesn't really know what he's doing. And there's all these shadow people behind him, influencing what's going on. He's just a figurehead. So that's one of the themes of the story. Let's say he's this, this beast. This uh, I don't know, even know what to describe it as. But there's this town where the parents are are afraid of this this monster that they can't even describe, which would be Trump, let's say. And they need to sacrifice everything, including maybe even their children, to make to, to feel safe again. And that's really kind of the theme of the whole story is what are this the, the all the parents in this town are willing to sacrifice their children to this beast to, so that the whole town can be safe one more time. And then it's, it follows the story of the main little girl character who who she's she's like us, I guess, and that she's a little jerk sometimes. And she doesn't want to be sacrificed like a bad little kid. Mm. And so she fights back, sort of. And the whole story is what happens to her, her little adventure. She sees the world around her going to hell. And she's she gets sacrificed, but then she kind of snaps out of it and saves herself and her friends by disobeying her parents and uh the, the kind there's a lot of different little threads um but that's kind of the overall story is the whole town has gone crazy and they're sacrificing the future so that they can feel safe in the present and actually that's the opposite of what historically leads to good a uh, good society is we the parents have to sacrifice ourselves now so that the future can be better for our children but these people are doing the opposite. So we take little biblical themes of like, <clears throat> I draw sometimes uh, cultists holding up babies and stuff, like sacrificing them to, in the biblical stories, there's um, uh, Moloch, Moloch. Yeah. You know, you hear all kinds of Old, Old Testament stories of like cultures who would throw, literally throw babies into fires and stuff, uh, sacrificing them to idols. This really happened throughout history, and that's horrifying. Yeah. So I gave it a little silly twist where it's, you know, obviously it's a monster snake, but it has happened throughout history. So it is actually incredibly scary to think about, but I tried to make a little story that was maybe for an adult, scary, but funny, and also a little therapeutic to kind of get us through the next four years, I guess, because I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, but uh, I made the story and it seems, uh, it seems people liked it and I'm very proud of it. Well, I, I I would think I, I the thing that is, I mean, the most striking and profound that's the theme that carries over is I mean you mentioned that it is the parents that traditionally are supposed to protect, and sacrifice themselves for their kids and they decide to protect themselves and you I which I I see that I guess for what happened recently with COVID actually, <laughs> um yeah it happened. Um, like Glenn Beck early on he was talking about um on his radio show that it doesn't seem to be hurting kids and it's, you know, the elderly who are at risk. And he said, I would sacrifice like my life for the sake of the country to go on and continue and so on. And so people ripped into him, thought he was like crazy and selfish. And even like people on the right were like talking about crazy Glenn Beck. And I'm just like, what he said makes sense. But I just kind of joked a little and said like, well, to be fair, he said, I volunteer as tribute. He didn't say we had to sacrifice all the old, old people, whatever he said, what he's willing to do. And, um, and then like, you know, about a year later, uh, he was on Megyn Kelly's podcast and he was talking about how a police officer came to his door to ask him questions about his daughter. Cause they heard like through other people and the police got called cause his daughter was apparently suicidal. And so, um, I'm like, well, that is a sad way to be vindicated. Um, to think about all the harm that we're doing to our children, um, but but he was right. Like it's it would have been better to to be at risk. And I I find the lockdowns and all of the stuff that like people say we're immoral because you want to go outside and like live your life and open your business. Like I think it's immoral what we've done as far as the lockdowns, not just yeah. like politically our rights and so on. But the the fact that like when stories started to come up that our supply chain could be broken, like there's a story like. Not starvation maybe here, but like in other like third world countries, it could lead to starvation there, and like millions of people could die from the, like the after effect. I'm like, why are we locking down? <laughs> like this is like a bad thing. 
thing. It's the worst thing you could do, especially for young people. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I have these young people in my life. I won't say more, you know, because creeps. But there's these little people who I love to death in my life. And um, I took them out to uh, for a walk. And we went to a playground. And, you know, I see them once in a while. And um, we went to a playground and there's all these kids with masks on and they're running around playing on the swings and they're they're all talking to each other, making friends. And some of them are making friends with each other, like even better than others. And I don't know. They were they were having a blast. They, they didn't want to go back. They wanted to be out for the whole day and play. This happened a few months ago. And when we were exhausted and walking back, uh, they told me that they had not interacted with other kids for a year. And I, I was like, what the hell happened to you? you poor kids like they they were so starved for social interaction with other kids that they had not even been to a playground in a year in the most important delicate fragile years of their lives so i don't know like kids are also really i i guess ask me again in 10 years maybe i want to see how this turns out for them but like they they seem to have somehow made it through this. It, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to affect them 10 years from now. I'm glad that it's mostly over for them, but I hope it didn't like really damage them. I don't, I can't even imagine how it would damage them. Um, but all we can do now, now that it's mostly over is like, we learn the lessons, horrible lessons, especially uh, the, d the dangers of overcorrecting are the worst possible outcome for something like this. We thought it was the plague. It turned out to be the flu. Okay. So let's not starve our kids anymore of social interaction, which is like water to them. They need it. Yeah. They need to be around other kids. Um, they don't want to be scared all the time. So maybe don't act like this is the end of the world and scare the lights out of your daylights out of your kids. The poor things, they don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that, that was heartbreaking. Yeah, I, I I can't believe so many tweets of people that are like, oh, my kids can do this or, or like teenage, like young people who are like, oh, I haven't been able to do this and this. And I don't know how much I believe either, because I'm like, so, there's a lot of people out here like living their lives, like especially like in like little urban cities, like people still getting their hair done and all like people using their COVID checks to go get surgery, not pay for bills. Like these are like real things. Maybe they can start an OnlyFans yeah. account or whatever. But um, I, I have a um, one of our, our our members had passed away from from cancer last year, and so that I also have the perspective of people die from other things. So I don't want to like pause my life over COVID. Um, but she left behind uh, two girls and a husband, and so. Um, we we haven't seen them much because um well they they weren't really going because the mother was was suffering with her illness and um the father's not a not a member um so so anyway um one of the girls called me uh not too long ago and we did like face chat and she told me they don't have in person learning so when they do their Skype things the classroom's on but the kids aren't talking to each other she says she could maybe talk to the teacher maybe like once a week. Um, and she's like in the fourth grade, so none of her friends really have phones. Um, and she has a phone cause she has her mother's phone. Um, and she was saying that if 70% of the population gets vaccinated, then maybe they can go back to in-person learning. And so, um, she was handling it as chipper as I could tell, but I'm like, this is evil. <laughs> like that that she doesn't even know if she can go back to school in the fall now but people have pushed back or biden like the news cycle was so bad that cdc and white house have said whatever and now even like the unions are like well maybe we should go back to school and it's like okay that's not what you're saying like a second ago and there's no news data so uh, there's probably data but it's probably polling or something it's not like scientific data <laughs> you know, that yeah. they decided to reverse decisions or whatever. But at the time I was just like, so grieved for them, um, that, <laughs> that they had to face this, the most awful thing that could happen to you. Um, and still not be able to see their friends 
and to be isolated in such a way. And if you're a kid like my my nephew, he just started like kindergarten and he's doing it online. He's he's and he's still seeing people because he's coming to church, hanging out with family and whatever. But he's not used to like going to school every day and seeing like faces of, of friends and stuff. You know, it's not the mm-hmm. same for like him. But these kids who who are used to it, who are missing their friends, it, this is just devastating. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we'll know what the damage was until ten years from now. Um, but I hope for the most part it's over. I think most states have had enough. My state, unfortunately, is being stupid. But I, I hope that other states don't continue to make the mistakes that we are. Um, I, I want everyone to go back to normal and um, be be responsible, accept responsibility for your own like lives and not worry about what the other states are doing. Uh, I know a lot of people on their, I don't know, I went to the ice cream shop the other day and I was not wearing a mask because F it, if I'm outdoors, I'm not wearing a mask, I say. Uh, and other people to get ice cream at an outdoor ice cream shop were still wearing their masks. And I'm like, all right, you guys do you, I'll do me, and we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm not playing this game anymore. Yeah. If if I go into a store, I will respect other people because I don't want them to panic. So I'll wear a stupid mask. But um, I don't want other states to have to deal with stuff like this anymore. I want everything to open up again. I want kids to be social and happy. And if you get the coof. I don't care. Uh, I think we'll be fine, most of us. Um, if, if a person's at risk, I think they should strongly consider getting a vaccine, but that's none of my business what they do. Uh, but yeah, this is not the plague. This is not the zombie apocalypse. So we got to stop treating it like it was. Um, yeah. yeah. People make mistakes. Oh, I'm sorry. People make really bad mistakes when they're afraid. And that I think that's what happened here and in other cases too, uh, sociopolitically in our history, uh, and in life too. When people are trying to make you afraid of something, be very cautious because they might be trying to provoke you into overcorrecting and making an even worse mistake. So I, when people, you, you, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, you said a mistake, and I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of more. I, I think there were mistakes, obviously. Like I, I think I think the Trump basically when they. And they were telling him all kind of crazy things. Like they were telling him like two million people are gonna die. So, um, so it kills me when people are like Trump didn't do anything. Like he risked the a slamming economy and his like election to 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 try and stop this thing. Like you may not have liked his job, but why are you lying and saying he did nothing? Let's, so that he tried that, to stop international travel, and they called him racist. <laughs> They, they make up your mind. Yeah, they're 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 wildly insincere about anything that 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 comes to Trump. But basically, the day that he they entertained the like we should pause like 15 days to slow the spread. That was basically the beginning of the end of his presidency. And and by if you Biden, Gretchen Whitmer, Newsom, like other people have like there's recordings. I even did like a montage of like people saying things like this is an opportunity to push policies or whatever that they want. This goes back to um, the Rahm Emanuel who said, never waste a good... Well, I think he got that... Did he coin that phrase from somewhere else or was it him who made it up? Never I'm waste a good crisis. That. Yeah, never let a good tragedy go to waste. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then Hillary Clinton said, never waste a good crisis. And so... <laughs> yeah. um, so, so that's their mentality. That's their mindset. So I, I don't... I, I believe some people reacted out of like fear or whatever, but um, I, I, there's, I, there's, I, there's too many things that were obviously intentional... Um, to, to cause harm and to cause a result, obviously with like Trump not being in the White House, for example, um, that that they that they did, and um, I I think I think in Michigan, where I I'm from, unfortunately with Gretchen Whitmer, that they would keep the lockdowns and keep doing maybe dumb stuff, but I think uh, they may be a little concerned because I think she figured that she could be anyone who's going to run for governor. But now there's a black guy. Uh, he's a police chief of Detroit, and mm-hmm. people are like, "Oh my gosh, he's a Republican." <laughs> so <now> they're scared. <laughs> That's the perfect, the perfect counterattack. Like they can't say anything about that except call him really racist names. Like who was uh what Uncle Tim? What was his name in South Carolina? Uh, the, uh, Tim Scott. Tim Scott, right? Yeah, that's all they can do is call you names. That's all they got. Once once they realize you're not one of them and you're not buying, you're drinking the Kool-Aid, they're helpless. 
because they thought they had this whole community in the bag. And it turns out, oh, they can think for themselves. Imagine that. I'm so insulted. <laughs> I have... It, it used to be, like, super insulting, and now I'm, you know, when people say, like, call me a coon or something, I just call them a racist, because I'm like, how dare you think that white people or other people have the freedom and agency to make decisions based off of facts and or other things, but black people aren't allowed to do that. So I don't care if you're black and you say it, or if you're white or whatever. If you call me a coon, I'm going to call you a racist and not even blink. And I used to be really careful about me throwing that word around, um, but... Like, if I was engaging with someone, I'd let them, like, really say it a lot before I, I throw that word. But if you call me a coon, I'm just I'm just going to let you know. that That's how I feel. That's what you are. So I just, you know, throw that right back at them um, if they want to judge me in that way. I don't know. Now it just kind of rose back off my back a little bit. It happens so often. It's pretty unbelievable. <laughs> Being called a pick-me is, is kind of new. I, I don't know if that's, like, a, a TikTok lingo that they really 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 use over there on that app like if you just kind of say things to get clout from white people and i'm just like um i've had these opinions my whole life even like before i was really exposed to a lot of white people because i grew up in like a pretty urban area and um and then eventually we went to like a, a rural area um but i was still a kid <laughs> so it wasn't like i knew of politics but i wasn't like you know leading the charge so it's it's just silly well when that's a good lesson for anyone who wants to engage in these fights when they start insulting you like actual insults and not attacking your what you're saying they have in their minds already lost and they just want to hurt you now so when people insult you and call you names consider that a victory and you can now walk away from the conversation knowing that you got them um I've, you know, they can't really use racist stuff on me necessarily, but they've called me every name on the book, every other name, like blank cyst, blank phobe, all that stuff, because they can't actually engage with what I say or draw or anything like that online. And I have, I've known people who also, they engage with, they call it ad hominem. That's what it's, mm -hmm. that's the word is. I'm going to attack you as a person. Hey, uh, George, I don't, I don't agree with what you're saying, but you're really ugly, so no one should listen to what you have to say. Uh, great conversation. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But what they're really trying to do, they're not going to win you over. Um, and you know that you're not going to win them over. What you're really trying to do, both of you, is convince or persuade the audience, anyone in the middle, to come to your side and agree with you. So it's a show. All of this is a show. Yeah. And when they call you names, th your strategy is perfect. Get them to keep calling you names, and if it doesn't hurt you, that means you've you've leveled up your armor so much that it can't hurt you anymore. But let them reveal how detestable they are as people. Let them say the nastiest stuff they can think of. The Uncle Tim thing was the recent thing. It's like, look how many white people are calling him that. And they claim to be on the side of the, uh, the downtrodden and... The, the poor people who have been struggling for so many years, even though they're born in the most rich country in history and have all these privileges and stuff. So let them reveal how nasty they are. And your strategy is perfect. It's just take it and let them reveal it. Um, I, I, I also have to work on my armor because I take insults very badly online. Uh, so I have to work on that. But your, your strategy works. I'm going to do that more. Well, um, you, you do great work, so, I mean, uh, please, I guess, beef up that armor, because <laughs> you do great stuff, and I, I really enjoy when you come out with stuff, I mean, in your speed, like, I was so happy to see, like, that coyote, like, comic that you did, <laughs> like, with the coyotes, like, carrying children across the border, I don't think you colored it or anything, which... Oh, yeah, yeah, no, you're right, yeah, that was during the debates, I think, uh, Someone, it wasn't Biden. He was talking about the coyotes carrying children over the border. It, it wasn't. It wasn't Biden. But they they mentioned like why aren't the children reunited? And Trump's like people. They didn't come with their parents. Like coyotes brought them over. And there was just <laughs> some woman. From, was, she was an elected official and a lawyer from somewhere down south as a Democrat. And he was like, how she could, how you gonna bring over a whole child? And it wasn't just her. Like, um, the is it David Hogg or uh. From, from, 
uh, the Mike, the liberal yeah, pillow dude. Pillow kid. Yeah, and other and other people like I have screenshots of people saying that stuff, and and I understand that there's people who don't know what coyotes are, yeah. but like to be like Trump's a moron, coyotes <laughs> like. <laughs> like it's, but that's that's all we can do. I think is laugh and try to be cheerful. Like as scary as all this is. The other side are revealing how stupid they can be too. But you know, there's, and, there, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's there's yeah. something that was really dark that was like revealed at that point of time when I saw the reaction to that. It's just how dangerous your compassion can be without any intelligence or research like backed behind it. Oh, yeah. it and because like people were so sensitive about that topic, they hated Trump. There's there's like. Biden evangelicals or whatever that voted Biden specifically for that topic, which I don't understand because as Trump said, who built the cages, Joe? Like it was Obama and Biden. So how they got away with it is just beyond me. But um but the people people were so invested in what was happening under Trump's tenure, but they didn't know enough, care to know enough to even know what a coyote is. It's very surface level what they know. And I think the people who take advantage of that know that too. Yeah, they people, do. Most people only read headlines or to look, or look at pictures. And they know that that's why they put incendiary things on headlines and bury like important information yes. in like paragraph and, 17. And they lie and nobody sees the retraction. So I think just a general education of the common person, myself included, we just have to pay more attention like when when they say there were no riots, there were only protests, and the guy, this is a most peaceful protest, and there's a fire behind it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We need. It, I think it's our job to just tell everyone, hey, look how stupid and self contradictory they are, right there, and just point out every instance, make people realize you're not being told the truth. That's why. Uh, Trump's thing with fake news and everyone's talking about fake news. That was a good move. Yeah, we need more of that. It's funny they they the, their side came up with it and he weaponized it against them actually. So yeah, that was like great. That was like popcorn. That's, I love that day. I love that's a that good day. move in general against them. Like right now they're teasing me because I quote have the same I tell the same punchline over and over again. Um, on Twitter, I, I draw certain comics where somebody gets mad and yells at the camera, like, hey, you're not wearing your mask. I notice you're not. Or are you vaccinated? And the guy smiles and he's mm -hmm. calm and he says, uh, yeah, sure, I'm vaccinated. And then she freaks out like, hey, prove it. And I've done that punchline like seven times now. And they're trying to come after me by saying, like, oh, look, you only tell one joke. You're such a loser. You're such a hack. I don't know why anyone reads your comics. So my reversal to that is trying to trick them into making fun of me so that more people read my comics so that like it's exactly what Trump did. They don't I don't know why they keep opening themselves up to this reversal, but I'm happy to take advantage of. And that's good advice for anyone who fights these people. Make them make fun of you because you win mm -hmm. almost every time. Just take it. Like, let them make fun of you, let them show how dumb they are, and then just smile through it. Maybe even add to the joke. Make it worse. And people will see who, like, their mockery just makes them look worse. If yeah. they really didn't care about me, they wouldn't even mention me. Yeah. But I think they see me as a threat. So they're trying to find some way. <laughs> God help me, they're trying to find some weakness of mine, and I have many. You know, they say I'm a bad artist and stuff. I'm like, oh, I get mad at that one. But, like, fine, I'll take it. Well, I, maybe I some, really like uh, your art, though. <laughs> you know, I think it's fine, and I'm happy just being there. I, I want to say it's fine. And that's okay. Uh, I just, I think what they're, do they're doing is trying to probe me. Uh, they're looking for psychological weak points that they can exploit. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's one of their tactics, really, is uh, for someone who's lesser known. I had this happen to me two years ago. Uh, they just overwhelmed me with criticism to the point where I wanted to vanish off the Internet. Um, but I came back and uh, that that's their strategy, really, is things like shame, uh, overwhelming so social pressure. They want to 
threaten you, make you feel afraid to keep talking. Um, and then if you're a jerk like me, uh, you'll want revenge for the insult. So <laughs> I will now do the thing that you hate even more because F you. That's my strategy. <laughs> I know you didn't want to get into two hours. Since we're like an hour and a half. So I'm going to ask you this final Sorry. question. It's fun, though. It's been nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in the book, you are pretty optimistic at the end, I would say, with the kids watching the world burn. And I, I can tell you were Peterson fan because they say now we have to clean our rooms. And that's like <laughs> yeah. the, the thing that he says. So are, are you optimistic about like the sense of the world? Was that like more kind of metaphorical with the parents sacrificing or do you feel like the next generation just kind of has to save us or do you feel like we can turn it around here? Um, I think our generation's uh, roll of the dice, our role is going to be inspiring the next generation to have a spine because our generation doesn't, I think. A lot of us just kind of, all right, so our parents' generation were kind of from the, the booming 80s, let's say, or the 70s. And they, they had it real good. And they didn't have to worry about as much as we did. After 9-11, let's say, a lot of things changed. There are kids now uh, reading my stuff that weren't even born during 9-11. Or they weren't aware of the world. And that, that blows my mind. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as optimist, optimism goes, is I have chosen and I have to continue choosing to be optimistic despite a lot of things frightening me out there. Um, because what's the alternative? Like, am I going to be like them? Like you see the footage of people screaming after Trump was elected, yeah, holding up signs and yelling at the moon and saying, no, right. I, I'm not going to be like that. I refuse. I refuse to be nihilistic I refuse to look outside at a beautiful sunny day like today and be like, oh, life is miserable. I, <clears throat> I mean, I'll give you another story like that. I knew an older guy who had a terrible life. Everything, he was miserable all the time. Uh, <laughs> and then he would talk to me and then he would just kind of look out at the sunset and be like, F it, life is beautiful anyway. <laughs> and, and he would always, he, but the joke is that he would list like this person screwing me over. My life is terrible in this way. I'm broke. Everything's bad for me. Ah, life is beautiful. <laughs> it's, it was, it was anyway, but because of something like that, uh, no matter how bad things get, I think being optimistic is a possibility. Uh, it's, it's something having to do with willpower yeah. uh, and I don't have much of it, but I am by nature a very scared little person and when I draw my comics I'm taking something that often makes me very scared or I'm very mad about and I try as an exercise every morning I read the news I'm miserable I hate everything and then I say how can I make this into something that I'll laugh at just so I can wrap my head around it and be okay with it existing uh, any number of examples I can think of, I'm sure, uh, after uh, after we're done. But like any comic I think of where something's really scary or bad, I just want to laugh at it so I can be okay with it. And maybe other people laugh about it too. And we realize this is not an overwhelming, terrible thing. Like at the end of Uncle Joe, you mentioned, the kids have freed themselves from the monster spoilers. And they realize they can't rely on their parents because their parents are... Uh, they tried to sacrifice them and the kids realize it's up to us now. So for anyone reading a story like that, yes, it, it is up to the next generation, but it's also up to us personally, the individual. Uh, we have to do whatever we can uh, play the cards that we're dealt. And then maybe we'll inspire other people to do the same, but I'm not going to hand like, uh, let's say, a generation after me, uh, I'm not going to hand my kids a bunch of debt and say, hey, I, I, I took all this money out and you're going to pay for it. Um, I think that's reprehensible. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is work myself half to death so that they can have a better life than me. And if the next generation, let's say there aren't many Trumps right now, not that he's perfect, but if Trump has inspired DeSantis, who I think is a better optics, better optics, and has similar policies to him. 
well, maybe there will be two people like that in a few years, and then four, eight, and so on. Yeah. And the net positive will be like, our generation is the generation that decided we're not going to just let the government trample on our rights all the time. And we grew a spine, and then we inspired the next generation to have an even better uh, grasp of policy. Like a lot of lawmakers right now don't even understand the internet, for instance, but they're making a lot of laws that have to do with the internet and censorship and surveillance, and it's all very creepy to me. Yeah. But they don't even know how to send a freaking email. <laughs> so I hope the next generation learns from our mistakes. I plan to go down fighting personally. Uh, whatever that means. I, I want to inspire the next generation, but I don't plan to stop fighting myself. Yeah. Uh, and I hope more people in our generation does that too. It's, we can't expect other people to come to help us. Uh, we have to take responsibility. Like I think of it, uh, one more thing, I'm sorry to ramble. Uh, no. I think of it in terms of like wars, for instance. We didn't have, our generation didn't have a World War I, which was a horrible waste. World War II, uh, Vietnam and all that stuff. We don't have a war, personally. I never went to war. But we're fighting in a Cold War, post-Cold War culture war, where maybe I'm not getting bullets shot at me, but my reputation is being shot to hell. But what's the noble thing to do? If a person's strong enough to fight for what they think is the right thing, is, is it not noble to give everything you have even if it's scary, like I'm not having bullets shot at me, so it's not that scary. I'm not storming Normandy, for God's sakes. Yeah. But I can do I can do one thing fairly well, whether that's something that God gave me or I developed, whatever. I can draw decent little stupid comics. If this is what I've been given, for some reason people are telling me to keep doing it. Like, fine, this is me now. Um, I think this it's like a calling or something. I've been sitting on my hands like my career, my whole career has been going nowhere for years. And all of a sudden, it's exploding. So the universe, whatever, it's telling me this is what you got to do. So that's what I'm... It's, it's really scary sometimes, <laughs> but uh, it's... I feel like this is what I've got to do. And I, I look back when people criticize me when things get really rough for me. Like a lot of people say nasty things to me all the time. Like, even today, I posted a comic that, like, people are being really nasty about. It's like, I read it, I thought about it, I slept on it, and I still read it this morning, and I said, no, this this is good, this is right. I'm going to post it anyway, uh, even if people come after me for it. <clears throat> so, that's the plan for now. I'm, like, looking it up. I didn't see it this morning. <laughs> but, um... I hope suddenly you're, like... <laughs> You're not suddenly disgusted with me and you regret talking to me. Oh, by the way, why? what's with the um, your profile picture of... Um, Mr. Darcy? Yeah. Do you... Uh, are you a Pride and Prejudice fan? Uh, I have seen the film, that oh. particular film. My sisters watch it all the time. So okay. I've seen it a lot. Okay. I've heard that soundtrack a lot. <laughs> all right, yeah. Uh, so I'm actually a huge Jane Austen fan. Um, I've been for a long time. Sense and Sensibility is my favorite. But Pride and Prejudice is a good example of a character who, Mr. Darcy, for people who don't know or care, and why would they? Uh, he's, he's a real jerk on the outside, and the thing of the story is that he's, he's cold and proud, and Elizabeth, the main gal in the story, is prejudiced against him, judging him as a cold guy but it turns out he's actually really nice on the inside. Mm -hmm. So the joke is that people are mean. They say I'm a jerk and stuff. It turns out actually I'm doing what I'm doing because I have a certain sensitivity to some things. And uh, if people get that or not is not my concern. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, that, that makes yeah. sense. That's, that's, yeah. that, that's interesting. Um, yeah, but I, yeah, I've seen that film a lot, so I, I totally get it. <laughs> Actually, I my, like the BBC ones a little bit more than the movie, but yeah, I I hear that from people. But um, my sister started watching that one and they didn't like that one, and they're like, and I know there's not even like the in the book with the scene with the rain. We're like, they didn't even have the scene in the rain. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, the the sister yeah. I talked about who bought Creepy Joe, that's one of her top favorite films, and like, mm -hmm. but also in her top favorite films is um, 
Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies, and I think, <sighs> and Austin Land. Like, they all are. I've seen Austin Land a lot, too. I don't know if you've seen that one. No, I haven't. Uh, it's about a, Carrie Russell stars in it, and so she's obsessed with Jane Austen, and she goes to, like, pays, like, all her money to go on a trip to, like, <clears throat> to Austin Land. It's like a period piece film kind of setting where you, like, have a your own love story they build for you. But but she's like paid for like the lowest version, so they treat her like trash. <laughs> so it's it's very funny. So <laughs> I'll write that down. I'm gonna see that. So yeah, I've seen I've seen that film a lot. As a matter of fact, we were first when we were first watching it together, I was, um, I, we were we were kind of hard up for a time, and so the family was like living in a hotel at one point. They're watching Austin Land, and I was like facing the other way. They didn't even know I was paying attention. And at one point, I was like, "What?" And they're like, "You were watching the movie." I was like, oh, "I can hear it." Like, oh man. So so yeah, if you if you're a fan of that, um, I would at least check out Austin Land. It's pretty it's pretty sure. funny. To just kind of close. Close. I would say I, I'm willing to go down fighting myself. I, I, and like politics, I, that's that's like my bread and butter. Like if it, it at times I thought like if I could walk away on some things and just like because I I write myself too and I do on some level I'm kind of concerned sometimes because there's like trolls who will follow you and like write like nasty reviews and I don't have a lot of reviews like on like Amazon and stuff. And I'm like one could just like you know, just take your whole, like, rating down, you know, if they put one star, which someone did one time. So I, I think about things like that, but I'm like, you still, we still got to, like, stand up for things. And my, after, like, Biden won, my sister, um, she's the only one of us who are married and has the three, the three kids, well, ones who saw the Creepy Joe book, um, she called me and she's like, are you concerned? And which I had told her a list of things Biden was going to do, which obviously she, as a mom, she would be concerned. And I'm like, I'm not personally concerned. Cause like, I mean, I believe my help coming from the Lord and like I'm ground, I'm rooted in more things outside of politics. And I believe strongly in like self, you know, responsibility and making your own life and so on. Um, but I said, I, the things that we want to do or to change the world, I feel like it would take a lot of time. But I said, I like we're ministers and stuff. So I'm like, we, we have to reach people on kind of a different level. And so if we're doing what we do well, I think we can have the impact we need to have. Like, I think the two main problems today is that people don't have any, like, self-responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and, and, that, and that's really major, but also that they don't believe that they matter to yeah, a degree. Yeah, blaming others for their problems and not accepting that they can dig themselves out. They, they want other... Yeah, they want other people to help them out of the hole, but it's also other people's problems that they're in the hole to begin with. Maybe it's true because part of it because we're we can't control what we're born into. Mm-hmm. But that's to lay down and say I can't affect my life, I can't change my life, even though things are really bad for me. It's like giving up. Yeah, it's like saying you are not a capable adult. Some people, let's say are born with disabilities and maybe they can't help themselves. But through sheer willpower, I think more people than we realize can just decide, I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm going to pick up, you know, I'm going to pick myself up and fight as hard as I can to have a better life than say my parents did or whatever I was born into. It takes crazy willpower. Yeah. And I'm not going to act like I don't, like I don't have a lot of willpower myself. But I've seen a million instances of people where they they have to decide, I am in control of my life. I'm not going to blame other people for what situation I'm in. Sometimes, no matter how hard you try, you can't get out of it. Like I have – my great-grandparents were born in the Ottoman Empire, for example, in which is like – Turkish people back then, the Ottoman Empire, were treating Greeks real bad, let's say. Yeah. They were stuck, right? And they had to leave. They had to. It took them three generations to end up in America. And I'm first generation American. And reflecting on how bad they had it versus how good I have it, even though I was born in, let's say, lower middle class, whatever, I am so lucky to be here right now. And I'm not going to waste my opportunities. And I, I want other people to realize, like what you were saying, uh, personal responsibility means everything. And not blaming the outside world for our bad luck, which may be legitimate. Um, 
I don't know. I, well, that's one reason why um, I like Jen Psaki, like they asked her a question about um, critical race theory and she just pretended like it was like about systemic racism and like, like, as if people don't learn about the history of bad things that happen in America. It's just, like, such a false, like, narrative to, for even people to, like, pretend. Like, we learn about slavery and bad things, like, in elementary school. Like, no one does believes that America is, like, a, you know, just a perfect thing. But obviously, I believe it's the best country in the world. But but to pretend, and I hate it when Chris Wallace also did this on the debate stage, and they just pretended, like critical race theory wasn't evil and it wasn't isn't teaching people to hate white people but it's deeper than that like i don't know if you saw the the infographic that the black Ameri- african american history museum the one in dc put out about whiteness and they had a list of characteristics of whiteness and they've had things like believing there's only one god believing that hard work pays off being attracted to people who have money, <laughs> being on time, respecting authority, private prop like things that are just normal, like good things. Uh, yeah. And so I'm like, they're, they're, tr- they really want, and I told like, my cousins and family about, and like, well, it's all, it's laughable, but it's disgusting. I'm like, they really want black people to have no sense of agency. And it, it goes back to the cold war. war. It goes back to, um, you know, like, uh, in color communism and common sense um the author of that book was a black communist and then he like came out of that and he wrote about basically how they had a plan to basically make black people trash population <laughs> and could do yeah. the stuff that is happening now and so i feel like that's something worth going down swinging on i feel like a lot of this gender i ide- you know ideology stuff is stuff worth going down swinging on and um and th- this stuff plays such a bigger role than than people want to pretend. Like, like I saw Matt Walsh arguing with like a libertarian the other day about it. Like, that, he wasn't saying it wasn't important, but we just focused too much on it. I'm like, n- no, like we focused like not even the appropriate amount of like outrage with some of this stuff. What they're doing is trying to motivate their foot soldiers into action. And it's something that actually used to take place in churches during like revival meetings and stuff. It's in order to get people fired up and passionate, you have to give them incentive. So in these cases, they're trying to make their foot soldiers angry. You're being oppressed. The world's against you. You've got to get motivated. And they're converting people to their little religion. That's not a religion, but it is. The only way they can motivate people into That's totally action. Religion. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like there they you have to convince people there's a crisis before they'll act and that's just human nature. They know it better than I think our side knows it. I think so too. But we have to also snap out of this idea that reasonable people are going to wake up. I don't think most people want to wake up. I think they need to be woken up. So I'll use something like humor to to point out, hey, this is a really stupid situation. Wouldn't it be bad if this started happening? And then it does start happening. And they realize, wait, I was laughing at this a week ago, but it happened in real life. So I think our challenge, our generation, is to snap people out of it and make them realize that this is a bigger crisis and it requires a response uh, before... (laughs) The other side gains too much. Like when I see people marching down the streets, breaking buildings and setting fires, I'm not going to just stop there. I know where that's going to end up because I've read history. I know that this is only the beginning if they keep having their way. We need to convince people that it will get so much worse if we don't do something now. And I don't know how to convince uh I'm trying not to think of a nasty word for like people who don't act or don't want to act, but like it, it's very much a, a war of persuasion right now. Yeah. Who who can convince the middle more effectively? And that's really so what time. politics is. I mean, it's just a war of, of persuasion and um, yes. And, and that, that really is a challenge. And I, and I, what you said, other people don't want to be woke up. I think that really, there's just a lot of people who just really genuinely want to be left alone. They don't think about these things like people, 
and like even with like news numbers that you think about like people are like oh tucker's killing it that must mean there's an out- outreach and like uh there's still all these other channels that are more than us there's people who don't even watch cable news they just watch 247 like locally and 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 so they're not even like exposed to it won't go online and like watch things and stuff that you and i will watch so um the question is how do you kind of get to those people and get them engaged and like i i think one way i mean like churches used to talk more like about kind of stuff like that like the civil rights movement was moved a lot through churches but after that lyndon b johnson was like oh we got to silence these negroes like so and they made a rule like the lyndon b johnson rule and stuff which i do feel like the the, they have like the levers of all the power and like the last kind of bastion is like the church and that's why you see like progressive Christianity like just psychotically trying to take over so for a lot of years church culture was very much about we're separate from our you know separate the church and the state uh, we have a, another country that's not uh, the United States a higher country that sort of thing but if they want to prevent bigger disasters from happening. I'm not saying have these conversations in church in place of, a, um, you know, a, an actual message, mm-hmm. but people who go to churches and gather, let's say we're having a barbecue in the backyard with all our friends. Maybe a lot of people might start talking about this sort of thing and realizing that if we don't at least talk about it, things will happen all of a sudden. And we'll say, how did this happen? It came out of nowhere, but we, we just didn't notice it happening. People warned us, but we didn't notice. Um, I think in the next two to four years, I think, uh, sorry, we already mentioned this, but the next two to four years is going to decide probably uh, were we able to stop it in time? Uh, 2020 was a warning uh, that there are uh, pockets of creeps and psychos meeting in secret We know this from books like um, Andy Noe's recent book, for instance. They're meeting in, like, bookstores and stuff and Mm -hmm. having all kinds of, like, they're having discussions of how do we uh, subvert culture and change it uh, Mm -hmm. in the way that we want to. And meanwhile, we're just sitting here twiddling our thumbs in our little communities, not even taking precautions against what happens when these people are coming down the street breaking windows. Uh, By then, it's too late. Uh, So just... I guess raising awareness is the the project for the next couple of years, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's making people aware and at least getting them to vote for people who are promising to restore, uh, I don't know, like we say, DeSantis and all those guys, they seem to at least take action. Whereas the Republicans of the Bush years were very much part of the establishment and I wouldn't trust them with, you know, babysitting a kid or something yeah which um it's 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 that even to see how they kind of spoken up now about things i'm like but you didn't say like a darn thing when obama was president and and they only like like they treat him now like he's just a nice old man who likes to paint i'm like I remember when Kanye West got up and said, I don't care about black people. I remember when Pink like wrote a song saying he wouldn't love his daughter if she, she were gay. Like I, like they treated these, this man, like the, the, he was Lucifer. And now they're like, well, well even he like dislikes Trump, but I'm sure they'll <laughs> treat DeSantis perhaps even worse than Trump. I'm not, um, I'm not sure, but um, that they'll have that narrative that the next person is always worse. But mm-hmm. um, I don't know if we'll ever see like, um, the sort of vitriol that they had for Trump that was like next level talking to a woman from my church she said most comparable thing was probably how people treated Reagan um, yeah Trump especially they can't control him so what we're seeing is kind of the equivalent of a tantrum they can't do anything they can't ruin his reputation because uh, every time they even talk about him he gets bigger yeah so that's one of the counterattacks that you can use against them someone asked me why do I keep like um like people will tell me like why do you address your trolls like on TikTok or something I started this thing and sometimes I'll sing to them like I did a video pretending to be a democrat and saying the see the big the switch happened we're not racist anymore and then it was and then I pretend to be a different person like why did you vote for Joe Biden and then there's a trend where you like use a Kesha song and you just and there's one point the point the song where she screams and then I like screamed <laughs> like like oh my gosh she got me and so someone comment commented and said sell out be selling out 
So I, I did another video where I just kind of smile. And then I start like, I took the song from Gold, Golden Girls. And I was like, thank you for proving my point. And I did like a whole intro and edited it like, a, you know, I had Joe Biden in there. I had like a Northam's like clan picture. Like, you guys are the racist. <laughs> so I'm like, as long as they keep giving me material like this, I'll respond and mock these jokers. Like the only trolls I don't like is when they get repetitive because you can't mute people on TikTok. Oh. So if they're just going to keep lodging the same stuff and like clog up my mentions i'm like i'm just gonna block you but yeah i would do that i think once once people there's criticism that you can turn into a joke and it's fun and then there's people who just want to hurt you and i think it's okay to block those people because they just want to waste your time uh by the way I, I read the the column while you're talking and i don't um I don't actually see a lot of, I mean, maybe I'm not seeing all the comments that you're seeing, but it seemed like a lot of people did get it. But I, I think probably people who are upset are just people who are like, obviously pro Palestine in the conflict, but it is a shocking oh. sort of thing, but it's a shocking situation where they, they hide in hospitals and stuff, you know, to hurt people. Yeah. So I, I think, um, this is a sort of like shock value thing that's appropriate. So, um, okay. Yeah, I, I thought it was, for anyone listening who can't see it, it's um, a boxing match between, like, Israel and Palestine, basically, and Palestine punches Israel, and Israel is going to counterattack, but it turns out Palestine's got, like, a bodysuit of kids, and it's really dark and gross, and I kind of hated drawing it, but the point being that it's, like, in order for Israel to counterattack, he has to not hit the kids, and the audience is saying to Israel, hey, you're not fighting fair basically. Yeah. And, um, I got some people like, so you got far right people and far left people who both seem to hate Israel and whatever they have their reasons. And those people are accusing me on like Instagram, for instance, of like getting paid by Israelis to like defend Israel with a comic like this. Or anytime I, anytime I make a joke that's not at the expense of Jewish people, for instance, they're like, Oh, he's, He's carrying water for them, that sort of thing. And um, so I'll get as much criticism from alt-right and far-right sources as I do from far-left. And it's kind of a horseshoe theory problem where for some reason, like the, the far-left will call me anti-Semitic for making a joke about AOC holding a star of Donald. Did you see that one? Uh, yeah. Well, someone right. replied it in the comments. I hadn't seen it before. If I just saw it. <laughs> oh, God. All right, yeah, so that that was in response to her saying, you know, we have to get people who supported Trump on lists. And I'm like, oh, where have we heard this before? Yeah. Uh, so she invents the star of Donald. That's the joke in air quotes. But anyway, people were calling me anti-Semitic for that. And it's funny that the same people who call me anti-Semitic also hate Israel. So it's like, are, are you going to make up your mind or you just want to throw tantrums for the sake of throwing tantrums? You, you know, I don't know, pe people throw that around a lot. Like, even, like, when we had conversations about Gina Carano, and they're like, oh, she shouldn't even said made that comparison. I'm like, I thought her, I'm sorry, I thought her comparison was fine, inappropriate. It was actually. very fair. Very, very fair. So, and, and, you, and you'll hear, like, people, like, Ben or whoever is like, well, I feel like comparisons are overwrought or whatever. Like, people do use it, like, a lot, in, in like, inappropriately, but I thought her, that particular comparison was absolutely like spot right. on. Like so the idea of mobs of people with government support gathering people into lists and say camps and the gulag and all that stuff to say, you don't have the right to make that comparison when it is true is all right. So me being Greek, right? My people, although I've never met my great, great grandparents and all that stuff, they were also genocided, but I never met them. Do I have the right to do the AOC thing? Like, am I anti-whatever? Do I have to have ancestors who have been through that to be able to say something like that? Mm -hmm. Or is just the truth the truth and pointing it out is enough? Um, I don't like playing those kinds of games. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of that either. I mean, I, I understand, like, spe specific cultural things, like, if it's in your, like, history specifically to be sensitive about certain things... And this is like a general thing, so people listening don't have to call me an assignment or whatever. I'm just generally talking now, but but history does belong to us all. Like for example, 
like the left would be making excuses why black people didn't want to get the vaccine, which I just think is kind of like an overarching, like not trusting the government kind of thing. <laughs> but um, Same with me. You know, my immigrant family also is terrified. Immigrants in general hate the idea of a vaccine. It freaks us out. Yeah, but but they so so but their excuse was like, well, they have a history with like forced sterilization and spe- but specifically the Tuskegee experiments where they were like experimenting on black people giving them placebos instead of g- and telling them they're like treating them for syphilis and not really doing it. And so I'm like, that doesn't make any sense that you would just excuse black people for being afraid of the vaccine because of that, because that happened to them. But because a lot, there's a lot of people don't even know about that. But I'm like, but white people have access to the very same Internet. So if you're an anti-vax, which white anti-vaxxers know that. More, knew, I just found that at like a couple of years ago. They've been doing that stuff. So, uh, so they have access to the same history. So how come it's not valid that they feel the same way that a black person may feel? <laughs> Anyone who understands human nature or has read any history will understand that at least it's possible in a crazy dystopia that a government mandate to get an injection can be, can be potentially very, very scary. So the idea of having to get an injection to just go out and resume your life, people need to come to terms with, okay, it's actually probably, we don't know. It might be okay. We have to wait and see if other people like develop second heads growing out of their shoulders or something. Mm -hmm. I would like to see if it's safe. Just wait a little bit longer. I don't know. I don't think you're a bad person for whoever's listening. Like, for waiting, it's okay. That's actually the most, I don't care what anyone says, that's the most sensible view out of everything. I get people who want to take it because they they have, you know, they're high risk or whatever. I, I get anyone who wants to take it. I get people who it's don't okay. want to take it. But the people who want to wait to see what happens, that is the most sensible th- like argument there is like yeah i'm gonna see what happens to you <laughs> like it makes sense don't act like these people are crazy no well i don't accept that it's right to call people names or like killer people like cuomo here in new york calling people killers or something like please uh i i but anyway i'm not gonna listen to people telling me what to put in my body or not and these are also the same people who want to talk about my body my choice and all that stuff yeah, but you know what the, Get the, out of here. The, the crazy thing about the just trust the government that you don't even need history just look at right now because i'm like there's people right now and i don't know we didn't talk about this so i don't know how you feel about it but um i'm very like very very pro-life and i'm just like there are people who convince you that a child isn't a child so they can i don't know keep getting funds from planned parenthood or whatever just just for the sake to keep a gravy train going they'll like totally disregard like they they use fetus like it doesn't mean unborn baby like it's a different specimen or something there's people who who consciously do that and if people are willing to do that why don't you think that they would misuse like the vaccine (laughs) something like that like never and i'm not saying that that's the case right here with the vaccine don't get me wrong but i'm just saying why would you ever trust the government that much it's a free science experiment for them. It's a new technology. They've been talking about that, too. They haven't had time to do tests, uh, uh, proper tests. I understand all that stuff. And they're not liable if something bad happens legally. They can't be sued. That's, that's true, too. That, that's, a, that's a thing that bothers people. It bothers me, too. I get it. But, look, I am all for the voluntary adults making decisions for themselves. I am as well. Go do what you got to do. If If – they want to make the complaint of like this affects society if people keep getting the illness and keep spreading it around because you're not vaccinated. That argument could be made potentially in a dense area like mine, which is where I wear a mask out of respect for people. But it's been proven as far as I'm concerned, if they talk about like a 99% survival rate, I'm not concerned about that being a world ending event anymore. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm resuming my life. It'd be different if it was polio and it was scarring kids or something like that, you know? Right. It's We'd have a totally we, different reaction to it as a whole, as a society, if it was like if it was like opposite of, of how it affects people. Um and if yeah, the mortality rate was, was more. And and I and it's not like I haven't had to deal with it myself. My dad was, had a very bad experience. He was in the hospital for seven weeks. Um and he, um, when he came back home, which they, we had to fight them tooth and nail for them not to put him in a nursing home. They, they were really, really pushing for it. And we're like, just give us our dad back. <laughs> like, 
like it was really weird and creepy and i i don't understand but we like we like at one point they're like well it might look like you're not listening to the doctors and and you're refusing care so that insurance might not pay for it we're like what <laughs> like so it was it was very odd but we got him back and he had to like learn how to walk again and everything actually he's in mexico on a mission trip right now <laughs> he just started walking again hmm. uh like uh uh maybe april <laughs> oh wow and he's 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 already all back on the mission feel like he's just passionate about it but um uh yeah so it's not like we, i've had to, to deal with it the, the the possible consequences of what will happen but society still has to go on regardless and you have to respect people's freedoms and their liberties and the decisions that they make everyone makes associated risks and that's this is what really kills me everyone makes a calculate calculated risk for what they do in life period but with yes. the covid thing they try to make like you're crazy like you were selfish and all this other stuff but everyone threw that out of the window like like it's wrong for you to protest in your car it's wrong for you to go to church and sit in your car and listen on the radio <laughs> Like you can yeah. find five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars, whatever for that. But it was fine for people to go out and, and protest for Black Lives Matter. When that happened, we should have just threw everything away. And yeah, that's the time where you call everyone in church and say, "Listen, we're going to jail. Ooh. Are you in?" <laughs> that's that's where I would uh, draw the line. Like that. There's a Polish preacher in Canada who got arrested. Did you see that one? Yeah. Uh, the first story inspired me a lot because he was telling the cops, for anyone listening, to get out. They're acting like Nazis. They're trying to shut down the church. And then later, weeks later, he got carried away uh, by a SWAT team or something because he dared to preach against Canada's rules. And I think that's the kind of optics that conservatives should consider taking advantage of to show uh, what happens uh, to us when we fight back versus what happens when – uh, crazy psychos fight and you know they get arrested and then released the next day yeah uh, out, bailed out by the vice president <laughs> or money right. that she basically helped the fund raise but that's fine you know what a religion that's based on self-sacrifice i think that those are the people who are at the front the tip of the spear let's say uh maybe they're built stronger than other people who aren't willing to self-sacrifice and i say so be it I mean, again, I'm not practicing necessarily, but I was raised real deep in this <laughs> ideology of we're following a man who gave everything and we want to be like him because he's the man. So I also want to do that because that's the highest character, the most admirable type of character that I could emulate. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm a scaredy cat, maybe a little self-sacrifice is honorable and uh, I can respect myself, even if people call me names. Uh, I, I think it's the right thing to do. So people who follow, uh, I guess you know, Christians can be good examples because they have self-sacrifice in their blood. Let's say, and maybe they'll start a chain reaction of other people being like, "No, we've also had enough of this," and that's how you overwhelm this little cabal of really loud Chihuahuas who seem scary until you actually stand up to them and and then they pretend like they're victims because oh no <laughs> it turns out uh, the people we've been oppressing are actually huge and uh, we woke them up by accident yeah well so I, that's what they're, they're that's, yeah that's what they're afraid of i think that is why they're afraid of them why they um insult people to so they won't take risks like i talked about people are like oh i can't well, like, you're so brave, but they'll also say stuff like, I can't say what you say because I'll be called a racist. And which I reply, <laughs> which I reply, well, like, <laughs> but I'm, yeah, like, yo, I can't say that because I'll be called a racist. I'm like, okay, but, and I mean, like, not racist things, but just like, you know, just mentioning like, me. but I, I tell them, I said, but I get called a coon. Like, <laughs> so we need to rise up together. Like, you know, it's not like I don't have risks, you know, and it's really like, it's one thing being called whatever from like black people, but I was just like thrown for a loop when like 
white Democrats started saying stuff too. I'm just like, where do you guys get the audacity to, yeah. to speak like this to me? So, um, and like I said, I, I just, you know, mock them or let it roll off my back or I just immediately call them a racist or whatever. But um, more people need to stand up. And, and I hope that, you know, conversations like this or just what I do or what you do will inspire people to do that. But we did reach our two hour, two hour mark. So I'm going to start to wrap it up. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. It was, it was good conversation. It was a great yeah. conversation. I hope to have another one, uh, you know, sometime for in the future. Sure, for sure. Um, so why don't you uh, just let people know where they can uh, get your stuff at? Sure. Um, I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram mostly. Uh, <laughs> my username is gprime85. And, uh, yeah, I think those are the platforms I'm mostly on. If I get canceled, I'll, I'll probably show up on, like, Locals, uh, some other platform somewhere. So you, you do have a Patreon? and you I do, yeah. Uh, but no pressure. I always say, like, there's people are struggling these past year, whatever. Like, it's not a big deal. If, well, they got to spend all their money on my pillows, huh? They can't help. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah, my stuff is, you know, supported by my readers. There's no pressure. I always offer my comics for free if I can. Uh, so we'll just see where this goes. I'm trying to do this full time. I'm trying to, now that everything's opening up, I actually want to take a bunch of, uh, donations that I've got recently and I want to like travel around and meet people and stuff and do conventions again. That'd be nice. Yeah. I, so. I, I miss going to conventions. Um, yeah, I, I'm still got console last year. I, you know, I haven't, well, I used to do like, um, actually my sister this point, we used to have this, me and two, my two older sisters, there's six girls, one boy in my family. And so the three oldest girls, we had a, a show that was like the gorgeous geeks. And we talked about videos and like comic books and other stuff like that. We go to conventions and we got to the point where we started like interviewing some celebrities and stuff. But, um, as I, I know we just got busy doing different jobs and then I got really into, to writing my own stuff that, um, when I went to convention, I didn't want to do gorgeous geek stuff so much. I wanted to like try to sell my own stuff. So we just kind of fell away from it. So, um, which is probably fine. Cause I'm sure if we got like lumped in with like Disney or somebody, they would have canceled us by now. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'd be where I am anyway. So, um, my, my sister said, Oh, it's really cool that you're getting to the point again where you're interviewing people that I really am excited for you to talk to but it's just like politics <laughs> yeah yeah it's weird even for me I never wanted to do politics but uh I mean I was drawing comic book books for the longest time before this um but it just uh, I, I don't know it's opportunities like this only come once in a lifetime um it seems this is what people want from us and <laughs> At some point, we have to decide, like, is a vocation, a, is it like a calling? Are we, do we decide to do this? Or or is it like, are we just told this is what, this is what you're just supposed to do? I don't know. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to at least, I'm happy to just have a job. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not going to complain, even though it can be rough at times. Uh, I, I think, that's why I'm optimistic, though. I, I think there's a good... Whatever's happening um, on the conservative side of things, I think people are realizing that being quiet is no longer a viable option because the problem is not going to go away. Mm -hmm. And then people like us who have big mouths, God help us. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we can. Uh, maybe our job is to inspire other people to open their mouths too. So I'm okay with that. Okay. Well, anyone listening, obviously you're watching this on a platform that I'm on like YouTube, but my handles are at Black Tea News. Please go to blackteanews.com. Check out content that I have there, articles that I've written, other videos that I have. Um, on Twitter, I'm at True Black Tea. That's my only handle that's different, but I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and so on at Black Tea News. And you can go to blackteanews.com and also check out merchandise and stuff that I have there. And, uh, I want to thank you again for coming on, George. I had a great time with the conversation, though. It, <laughs> we, we did. We we're talking a little long, but it, I thought it was a great conversation. So hopefully, people still listening, they feel the same way, and they're looking forward to next time. Heck yeah, Christina! Thank you for uh, talking to me. It was a lot of fun, uh, very refreshing, and I'll I'll do it anytime.